Okay, we will go ahead and get started. Um, I apologize, everyone. I'm at home. I do not have daycare today. So I have locked my daughter in her high chair with some lunch. So hopefully she doesn't bother us. Um, but we welcome to the 10 for 10 wellness challenge. Uh, we're going to go. So this challenge is going to be 10 weeks long. The goal is for us to hopefully lose about a pound a week. So 10 pounds by the end of this challenge. Uh, if you're not someone who needs to lose weight, there are other ways you can track your progress in this challenge, so don't worry about that. Uh, the basic concept of the challenge is there will be a weekly sort of webinar like today. Today is going to be probably a brief one because it's more of the introduction. Um, so each week we'll focus on a certain uh, topic to help you with your weight management or whatever it might be, uh, whatever your goal is on the uh, wellness side of things. And then uh, there'll be a goal that we'll set for ourselves at the end of each webinar, and you'll track that throughout the week. And then uh, we'll just track those things continuously each week when we check in. So I'll, I'll kind of go through that as we go through the challenge, but um, we will get started here. So today is just lesson one. It's probably not going to take the full 30 minutes, um, but I'm just going to talk a little bit about what the challenge looks like. And then also we're going to do a little primer into the dangers of obesity, type two diabetes and prediabetes and other unhealthy behaviors that often are associated with an unhealthy weight. Um, and that's just kind of to give us some science and some background so that when we get into these other topics around nutrition or fitness and more specific things, you'll um, have a better understanding of why uh, we should be eating certain foods or the right exercises we're choosing or something and how that all relates to health outcomes. So today's more gonna be on um, health issues and then the next following weeks will be on behaviors like nutrition and, and exercise and sleep and hormones and that kind of stuff. So um, as far as the challenge goes, there's gonna be, if you look in the chat, there should be a link to the, um, tracking sheet if you didn't get it it should also be saved in your calendar invite on your outlook um but you can click this google link and hopefully it will pop up for you too but this is just a generic tracking sheet um that you can use and the main thing here is we're going to track weekly our weight and i suggest you pick like the same time of day and same day of the week to track this each week uh, I've never been one to encourage you to weigh yourself every single day, but maybe once a week, um, because especially if you're a female, your weight will fluctuate even just in one day, let alone um, each week. So uh, pick maybe one day out of the week that you'll be consistent with in a certain time in that day that you can be consistent with. And also make sure your scale is probably the same scale each time, because scales definitely can vary too if they're not calibrated. So I know there's a scale down in the courthouse fitness room. Public health has a fitness room scale. So, and you can also use your home scales or whatever you might handy. If weight loss is not one of your primary goals for this challenge, you can change that first column to some other metric that you want to track throughout the um, this challenge. So maybe uh, fitness is one of your goals. So if you want to track maybe your waist circumference or pounds you're squatting um, at the squat rack or number of push-ups you can do or whatever. You pick whatever metric you want to do and see progress in throughout this challenge. It doesn't have to be weight. Um, I know many of us are going to pick weight, but you can you can modify that however you want. The next two cat uh, columns, activities and sugars, you can leave um, blank this first week, but we will start to add in what we'll be tracking in those columns as we start to add in uh, more sessions these next 10 weeks. So for this first week, we're just going to give ourselves a baseline weight um, to get ourselves going. And then we'll talk about these other two columns as we go through in the next sessions. You're certainly welcome to start tracking your physical activity um, habits and the grams of sugar you're eating, but it'll make more sense when we actually get into those topics of what we should be doing for exercise and what we should be doing as far as uh, carbohydrate and sugar intake to help you with your weight. So um, let me get back to my PowerPoint here. So as I mentioned, we'll be tracking our week, week weekly. Um, eventually we'll start to record our physical activity habits and then our nutritional habits as well. And the goals again are to lose one pound a week if it's applicable to you or whatever other metric might be, you can change if it's not weight. 
Um, we also want to improve in, in our fitness through increased activity if necessary, get better nutritional quality into our diets, all to reduce our risk for chronic diseases. And also, uh, because this is 10 weeks, hopefully we can create sustainable, healthy behaviors. And it's not something that's just kind of a bleeding New Year's resolution, but we can kind of stick with this for a while and create it into a habit. So um, any questions on the challenge itself before we get into today's content? You can certainly put it in the chat too. Uh, it, I should mention, if you can't ever log on to one of the noon Zooms on the Wednesdays, I'm gonna record them all and we'll put them on the YouTube channel for Stride. So you'll be able to access them all. And I'll send out that link to the YouTube channel uh, after today's session with this recording as well, so that you'll always have access if you can't make the noon session, so. Okay, pre-diabetes. This is um, just a, a brief primer on what pre-diabetes is, but essentially it's when your blood sugar is higher than it should be, uh, but medically defined, it's not high enough to be classified as type two diabetes. And, I, and then I put yet, because basically you have diabetes, it's just not to the extent of that a doctor is willing to diagnose it as diabetes, but it's not healthy. Um, sometimes prediabetes gives us kind of that kind of like pre high blood pressure thought where, oh, it's not that bad. I don't need to do anything about it, but honestly we should be. And so I feel like sometimes when people are considered pre -di to have prediabetes, they don't necessarily take it seriously and they should, um, almost one in three Americans has prediabetes. So this is super common in America. And yet nine out of 10 of those with prediabetes do not know they have it. And we're going to talk a little bit why, why that might be here in a couple of slides. Um, but a lot of it has to do with the American diet and the things that we're eating and the, the environments that we're exposed to. But we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. So a good chance that many of us on this session today have prediabetes. And it's not necessarily just those that are overweight. Prediabetes can occur in skinny individuals, overweight individuals, um, individuals who exercise, uh, individuals who might have a lot of other risk factors. So there's, um, there's a lot of different factors that go into it. And we'll talk about that more. The dangers for prediabetes pre obviously are that eventually you're at risk for developing diabetes as medically defined. And that also goes along with heart disease, heart attacks, strokes, um, high blood pressure, and lots of cardiovascular disease risks. The great news is that prediabetes is reversible and pretty well reversible through lifestyle changes. So better nutrition, better um, specific exercises, um, improved sleep, hormone balance, um, controlled stresses, and that kind of stuff. So we'll talk about all of those things as we go through these 10 weeks um, as well. Sorry, my slides don't want to progress very well. So what does an elevated elevated blood sugar mean? It means that when you when you eat, your body breaks down all those foods into different types of energy. Carbohydrates uh, are broken down into glucose, which is just a simple sugar to the body. And so when mm -hmm. you eat the food and it happens to be carbs, it turns into sugar in the blood that triggers the pancreas to release the hormone insulin. And then that insulin uh, enters in and kind of unlocks the cell doors of our body to let the sugar come out of our blood into our cells. And then that's what the cells use to create energy to do all the functions they need to do. So when everything's working well, that's great. We eat. If it happens to be a carbohydrate that gets broken down into sugar, insulin comes out, unlocks all the doors, the sugar goes in, um, our bloodstream is stable, our cells have energy, everything is happy. However, when you start to get into prediabetes and diabetes, these elevated blood sugars in our body um, don't necessarily react to insulin very well in, in several different ways. But basically, the insulin is not responding properly to the amount of blood sugar or the sugars in our blood. And therefore, the blood, they don't go in and lock the cells, the cell doors to get the sugar into the cells. And then our cells don't get their energy. And what happens then is when there's sugar stuck in the blood, the body doesn't like that. So it stores those sugars into fat because it can use fat more efficiently, even though we would prefer the body use it for energy. And that's why we'll talk about a little bit. A lot of times people start to gain weight when um, they have elevated blood sugars because their body's trying to protect it 
from high blood sugars. So we're going to watch a quick video on um, uh, type 2 diabetes, but basically associate this as prediabetes as well, because the same thing is happening. It's just not quite as exacerbated as full-blown type 2 diabetes, but the same processes are happening in the body. Um, and those are things that we want to try to correct. Let me know if you can't hear this too in the chat. Understanding type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is a metabolic disorder that causes sugar in the form of glucose to accumulate in the blood rather than being used as fuel by the cells in our body. When we eat, food is broken down by our digestive system into nutrient molecules that are then absorbed through our digestive tract for use by the body. Foods containing carbohydrates or various sugars are broken down into glucose. Glucose is an important source of fuel for many organs in our body. However, to be able to use the glucose for fuel, the glucose molecule must first enter into the cell. The pancreas produces a hormone called insulin, a chemical messenger essential for the entry of glucose into cells. As the blood glucose levels rise after a meal, insulin is released into the bloodstream and sets processes in motion to trigger the removal of glucose from the blood to enter into the cells. In type 2 diabetes, the cells become resistant to insulin and ignore its message to absorb glucose. This is known as insulin resistance. In addition, in type 2 diabetes, the pancreas is unable to produce the greater amounts of insulin needed to trigger these resistant cells to take in glucose from the bloodstream. The most notable symptom of diabetes is frequent urination and excessive thirst. Other symptoms include weakness, drowsiness, and blurred vision. These are caused by chemical imbalances in the blood related to high levels of blood glucose. About one in four people with type 2 diabetes are unaware that they have the disease. It is important to catch diabetes early. Over time, high blood glucose damages the blood vessels, which can damage the organs that these vessels supply, leading to a variety of health complications. Damage to the small or micro blood vessels can cause vision problems, including loss of sight, nerve damage, and kidney disease. Damage to larger or macro blood vessels can lead to cardiovascular complications such as heart disease, stroke, and poor blood circulation. Overweight and inactivity are major causes of diabetes. A family history of diabetes significantly increases your risk of developing the disease. Certain ethnic populations are also at increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Finally, some medications may increase your diabetes risk, specifically corticosteroids, thiazide diuretics, drugs used to treat certain mental illnesses, and some antiretrovirals used to treat HIV infection. In summary, type 2 diabetes is a metabolic disorder. It causes sugar, in the form of glucose, to accumulate in the blood rather than being used as fuel for the cells in our body. If not diagnosed and treated in a timely manner, type 2 diabetes can lead to many health complications. Okay. Oops, next slide. So there are lots of dangers to elevated blood sugars like they already talked about in that video. Um, obviously it's very detrimental to your blood vessels, which then feed into our organs, our heart, our lungs, uh, liver, kidneys, those kind of things. So heart attacks, strokes, cardiovascular disease or cardiovascular diseases are very much um, increased when you start to have diabetes or prediabetes. It also can damage your nerves. So you may have heard of people that start to develop neuropathy. Maybe that even can lead to amputations. Um, kidney failure, 
Eye complications, blindness is um, one of the strong risk factors for diabetes, uh, as well as poor circulation. And again, that can lead to amputations as well. Many people have complications with their feet, gums and skin becoming dry or itchy. So um, certainly all things we want to avoid. And uh, we can do that, like I said, through lifestyle changes. So we're going to get into... Uh, obesity quickly too, and then talk about how obesity and prediabetes kind of go hand in hand and one can kind of lead to the other. Uh, so what is obesity? It's an accumulation of excessive body fat, and this can be caused by many different things. Uh, many attribute it to a lack of physical activity. Others may have inadequate eating behaviors. Sleep definitely can influence our weight and the amount of fat that we store. Um, and we'll talk about that in one of our sessions more specifically. Stress also increases hormones uh, if it's uncontrolled. And even controlled stresses can increase our weight through hormones. Genetics definitely can play a part. Certain medicines can also cause your weight to increase and your body to store more fat. Um, I already mentioned some things about hormones, but we'll focus on that more in another session. Our environment, chemicals, toxins that come into play in our um, environment that our bodies are exposed are also are starting to show a pretty strong correlation to weight and health conditions such as insulin resistance. And I, we're just going to focus on that last one here today um, because there is some new science coming out around diabetes and obesity. So the kind of the old way and I call it old school, but traditional way of uh, medicine and science looking at diabetes is that typically we thought that being overweight um, led to people becoming diabetic or having prediabetes. So we used to offer a program at the health department. It was a type two uh, diabetes prevention class. Uh, you had to be considered to have prediabetes to be enrolled in the class. And the way we uh, and the, this is a CDC program, the way the participants were um, allowed to participate was if they were overweight. And so the thought was that because they're overweight, then that will lead to people becoming insulin resistance and then developing type 2 diabetes. So kind of the, the train there was you overeat, therefore your body starts to gain weight, and then that causes insulin resistance, which then allows you to put on more weight, and eventually this just develops into type 2 diabetes. So you can kind of see the sequence there below where you start with weight gain, that leads to insulin resistance, and then you develop type 2 diabetes. However, newer research and science is coming out lately that kind of flips this philosophy on its head and maybe actually makes a little bit more sense about why prediabetes and insulin resistance is becoming so common in our population and, and many different um, populations, not necessarily just those that are overweight. You've probably known people who have type 2 diabetes or prediabetes that maybe don't look the part. They're not necessarily overweight. Maybe they exercise. Um, um, maybe they're called skinny fat, um, but they have prediabetes. And then you probably know people that you would think are pretty overweight and are as healthy as a horse, do not have prediabetes. And you wonder how can that be? Um, this science kind of supports that notion. So what they're, what the new um, thought process is, is that when we overeat through our diet, mainly um, too many carbohydrates and sugars, our body then starts to produce too much insulin. And we talked about this at the, at the top of the session, but when our body doesn't use that energy, th that glucose as energy in the cells, it, it, it needs to get it out of the blood somehow. So what it does is then it turns that and stores it as fat. And then that's how we begin to become obese is because our, our insulin is trying to figure out a better way to manage this blood sugar. And instead of using it for energy or leaving it in the bloodstream, it's converting it to fat. So at a certain point, this insulin resistance is developing to try to um, counteract the, the, the high blood sugars. So this resistance becomes more and more severe until we develop type two diabetes. But basically what they've done is they flip-flopped the weight gain and the insulin resistance. So many people walking down the street that maybe do not look overweight still could be insulin resistance. And they just haven't got to the point yet where the body needs to start um, putting on that excess weight. So um, this probably supports more of what we're seeing as far as the patient population of people who come in and get screened and are shown to have elevated blood sugars. They're not necessarily those obese or super overweight individuals. They're maybe on their way to getting overweight, um, but it more has to do with maybe um, 
tweaking their, their diet and the amount of carbohydrates or sugars they're eating and or uh, burning through exercise. So this is kind of what that cycle looks like a little bit more in depth. Basically, they're saying excessive carbohydrate consumption can lead to insulin resistance and weight gain and type 2 diabetes. A way to get around that is to use that excess carbohydrate consumption um, by converting our um, glucose to gluc or through glucagon rather than storing it as fat. And we do that through exercise. And the latest research is showing the best exercise is actually strength training. So um, we're going to spend a whole session just talking about the specific exercises that help our body use carbohydrates the best um, and talk about some of the old school notions that necessarily aren't working. Um, you've probably, maybe yourself, I know I've been in this boat where you're someone who's like, I'm going to go run five miles or spend two hours at the gym and really aren't seeing the results we want or not necessarily making a big impact on our health. And it's maybe because we're stressing our body out too much on the fitness side of things and not focusing on the right exercise. So um, we're going to talk a little about that in a different session, but again, uh, just goes to show that this cycle is um, basically how we can best utilize the energy we give our body through our diet, the foods we eat, and making sure that we don't develop that insulin resistance, but yet can use that energy in the way that's helpful to the body, helpful to our weight and our health. Um, there are other things we'll get to as well. You can see in that far box, genetics are going to play a part. Um, getting good sleep. So if you're a parent with young kids that, or pets, that might not be <laughs> the time of your life right now. Obviously, stress is a big uh, contributor to, to this cycle as well. And those are all things that are going to be in future lessons. So we are going to talk, we're going to have a, a couple sessions on nutrition. So we're really going to focus on actually um, the benefits of a low carb diet and or the right carb diet. We're going to have sessions on exercise and really talk about those exercises that help with weight management and the benefits of strength training over maybe cardio or um, steady paced exercises that we traditionally were thought to do. And then we'll get into more of the hormones and sleep and stress factors as well. So um, that's kind of the gist of today's lesson. Your only homework for today is one, obviously, to weigh yourself this week. Um, you're welcome to track your activity and, and sugar intake, but that's not a requirement yet. Um, but I do want you to start to think or, or explore different apps on your phone uh, that you might want to use to track your activity and your nutrition, because it's going to be easier than pen and paper for a lot of you. You're welcome to use pen and paper, but a lot of people already are using apps. So choose whatever one you want. I know my fitness pal is pretty common. Um, there's several others. If you guys are using something awesome, share it in the chat so others can see it too. Um, I'm not familiar with all of them, so I'm sure there's some great ones out there that I'm not familiar with. But we'll start to track. You can we'll start. You can play around with those this week, and then as we get into the challenge, I will just ask you to start to use those more consistently so you can start to track some of these things better as we get through. So I'm going to end it there. Um, does anyone have any questions before we? end today. I'll pull up the chat just in case I missed anything, but I don't think I see anything. Macros first. Awesome, Hannah. Thanks. That's perfect. Um, and we're going to spend a session on macros. Some of you might not know what macros are, but that's basically carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. Um, and so you can kind of see where your body's getting its energy from, which is great. That will be perfect. So check out macros first if you're not looking. Thanks, Hannah. Okay, I will end it there. Um, we will check back in next week. I think, I don't have my calendar in front of me. I think it's gonna be on fitness. If it's not, it's a nutrition lesson. Um, either way, they'll be good. Um, and uh, like I said, if you can't get here on time, we'll record it so that you can have it as well and watch it at your leisure at a different time. Uh, Betty also posted my net diary. So that must be another good app. So thanks, Betty. Um, any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you for your time. Thanks for letting me start a little late so we could get everybody in. And if you do have questions in the meantime, you can email me uh, and I'll try to get you some answers. But good luck. Um, you can set your own goal for the week because we don't really have one yet until we get into our content. Um, but hopefully you learned a little bit more today. I know I did as far as kind of the new philosophies around um, type 2 diabetes. So thank you, everyone.